Welcome to another episode of the brand called You, a video and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Today it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome someone whose board I have served on, who I hold in very very high regard, who is a very senior political leader, Mr. Dagfin Hoybraten to the show. Dagfin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Charshatosh. Uh, Dagfin is currently the Secretary General of the Norwegian Church Aid, which is a major humanitarian organization. He was earlier the Secretary General of the Nordic Council of Ministers. He has been the Minister of Health, uh, Minister of Labor and Social Affairs in Norway. He was the chair of the Gavi Board from 2011 to 2015, which is where I served with him. He's been a leader of the Christian Democratic Party of Norway, and he's been awarded globally. He has so many awards, I can't possibly list them all in, in one minute. So Dagfin, what would you say are three key milestones in your life or your career? When you look back, uh, you're surprised of some of the milestones that were there that you never planned for. Uh, one is... Uh, when I had a chance as Minister of Health of Norway to be uh, leading on uh, in one of the first national bans on tobacco smoking uh, in any country. Uh, Norway was uh, second only to uh, Ireland in 2004 to ban smoking in public places, restaurants, bars, and so on. Uh, it was extremely unpopular at the time, but became a great success. And uh, what most people in Norway now remember from uh, my political career is, yeah. is that one. And it uh, sparked off a whole movement globally. So uh, today, no one really knows who started it, but okay. uh, that started in this yeah. part of the world. <laughs> wow. Wow. Secondly, I think um, being a part of, uh, of uh, the great uh, endeavor that, that we both served uh, for, for time, uh, the Global Alliance of Vaccines and Immunization of Children in, in uh, low-income countries, mm -hmm. I've never been in touch with anything as powerful as vaccines. I mean, uh, they save lives, uh, they save costs, mm -hmm. uh, they literally change uh, the... Uh, fate of uh, uh, people, families, villages, countries, mm -hmm. and uh, parts of the world. And uh, through the service of Gavi, uh, I've been a part of something that has literally saved 14 million lives since it started in 2000. Uh, and those children are going to be the future and the backbone of uh, not only of, of their families, but all their countries, all their economies going forward. It's the best buy in public health vaccination. Yes, I agree with you. I agree. And thirdly, I would say uh, now uh, as a seasoned leader, um, I have this uh, fantastic opportunity to uh, spend myself, my experience, what I have done, in public sector, in, in parliament and cabinet positions, uh, leading uh, public agencies, hmm. to spend that for humanitarian purposes uh, solely in a uh, civil society organization called Norwegian Church Aid, which is present in 30 countries around the world and uh, really deliver uh, very practically right now during the pandemic preventive health care, hmm. water, sanitation, hygiene. In, in remote places and uh, I feel I can, I can use almost everything I have learned and very still nice. I'm challenged every day. Very nice. So, you know, Dagfin, you have moved so easily between a political leadership role as a cabinet minister to the leader of the opposition, to the chair of Gavi, to, you know, leading organizations like the Nordic Council and now the Norwegian Church. What is the difference in leading such diverse organizations? Well, it's, uh, it's a great difference. You, uh, I believe in situational leadership. That means you have to take in the context. And if the context is complex, as it is on a diverse board uh, or a humanitarian organization operating in 30 countries, mm -hmm. you really have to understand uh, the, the power of culture and, and uh, differences. At the same time, you have to see that there is something that is at the core of leadership, which should be uh, common 
Um, and that is such things as integrity, transparency, uh, ability to, to uh, serve uh, a higher purpose without putting yourself at the forefront. I think uh, if, you, if you stick to some of those ideas, values, I guess we can call them, there is a great chance that you will succeed. It's no guarantee. But um, if you put yourself first, and, and uh, that is the only thing that matters, mm -hmm. uh, you are almost up to failure by guarantee. Wow. That's, that's a very profound statement and so true. I mean, I wish other pol politicians would not put themselves first, certainly in my country. So let's uh, come to Gavi. You know, uh, as chair of Gavi from 2011 to 2015, and those were challenging times, and we'll talk about all the money you, uh, you know, spearheaded to raise also. What were the key challenges you faced as the chair of Gavi? First of all, getting the right people uh, in leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, recruiting a new CEO was, was a task I was commissioned with by the previous chair of the board. And um, I'm so happy uh, for, for that recruitment of, of Dr. Seth Berkeley, who is uh, still the CEO and has done a fabulous job. Yep. And, and um, then mobilizing stakeholders mm -hmm. and... Uh, uh, support around the world that has to do about, uh, with uh, building confidence mm -hmm. confidence in the way that the uh, organization is run in the results and the efficiency of, of uh, running it and in the way we deal with challenges uh, such as misuse of funds which mm -hmm. occasionally uh, happen and um, uh, engaging in a in a strategic, uh, open dialogue with all the stakeholders. That's the, that's the bottom line. Fantastic. And, you know, during your term, you also were responsible for or leading a fundraise of over $12 billion. Now, that must have taken a lot of your time. What were some of your challenges? Setting the goals uh, on uh, knowledge base is, is number one. I remember <clears throat> meeting with the team uh, prior to, these were two uh, replenishments that I, I led, meeting with the team and asking what's possible, what can we do, what's, what's, what's in our power if we have the resources. And so that set the target mm -hmm. uh, because we, we wanted to let it be up to the leaders of the world to decide whether they would users for the, that purpose but mm -hmm. but uh, for instance the last time uh, the question was how many how many children's lives can we save in the in the course of four years and the answer is five to six billion lives in that four-year period and what does it take mm -hmm. well it takes 7.5 billion us dollars mm -hmm. some people i won't mention any name but there were some very influential people who said are you crazy dog finn mm -hmm. I said, if this is what we can do, and this is what it takes, then we have to present to the leaders of the world this opportunity. It's a fantastic investment. Uh, for every dollar uh, you invest in vaccines, you get uh, 20 times back. Mm. Uh, so so it's, it's a no-brainer when it comes to, okay. to economic uh, okay. terms. Mm. And when it comes to um, ethics, uh, how can you not do something that will save five to six million lives when you have the, the solutions for doing it right. and you lack the funding, well, you ask for it. Right. And we asked for it. And it was like a um, dream come true when, uh, when uh, we summed it all up in, in Berlin uh, in January 2015, yep. 7.535 mm. billion US dollars. We exceeded our target as we had done four years earlier in, in, in a similar uh, funding conference. Very interesting. So you know, staying with Gavi for one more question, or two more questions. The Gavi board is a very complex board. And I often used to wonder 28 board members, different cultures, different countries, different agendas. What was the role of the chair 
in managing such diverse constituencies and yet you know achieving results at the end of each board meeting i think at the bottom of a, a good uh, board leadership uh, lies respect for every single board member and uh, those things that the board member bring to the table mm mm-hmm. because that is what constitutes the pool of experience and resources in 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 a board and if you don't have that respect as a chair mm-hmm. for each and every board member you cannot uh, foster that respect between the board members mm-hmm. so that's number one secondly uh, of course um, you need to to uh, gather the board around some common agenda some mm-hmm. common strategies and some common way of working okay and and people have to like that mm-hmm. so so you have to find out okay. <clears throat> i'm i'm a typical scandinavian leader i like uh, i like to start uh, when we agree to start and end when we have agreed to end and, and produce the decisions uh, most of the time uh, that we had planned to wonderful most people in different cultures seem to to appreciate that at least after a while when they see that it really works correct and it's it gives the whole idea of of a board much more predictability mm. then i think uh, um you have to be human uh, because there is a core uh, despite cultural differences differences between pr- private public uh, ngo industry or uh, philanthropy and politics mm mm-hmm. there is a human core in every person um, we all we all uh, gather around the purpose of uh, saving children's lives right. so, uh, so you should also always be be careful with uh, jokes mm-hmm. uh, and humor but um, <clears throat> carefully done it works well wonderful <laughs> well said so let me move to the next uh, part of our conversation you know you have led different organizations different set of people over the years what are some of the core values you take into every leadership role first of all it's human dignity mm-hmm. uh, that is at the bottom of my own view of uh, life and it's at the bottom of uh, any any job i have done uh, if i think it's a driver also for my engagement so so that that is very simple actually it's to see people mm-hmm. and to respect them and to show that every human life counts uh secondly uh, in in leadership it's a, a lot about not only saying but doing mm-hmm. uh it's about walking the talk mm-hmm. it's in, it's about integrity and uh, out of that comes also transparency which is i would say key to building trust mm-hmm. in any leadership position you need uh, a capital of trust to draw on right. when things become difficult and if you haven't started building that capital it's like a bank account if it's empty uh, it's nothing to draw on so you need to build that over time and you do that by doing trustworthy things mm mm-hmm. and uh, you should uh, I think uh, live by the standard that anything you do or say in the organization should be able to be broadcasted on CNN or any okay. BBC or any any public place hmm. if it can't be there of course there are there are certain Correct. business yeah. secrets you can't reveal uh, because that's that's a, about discretion it's it's yeah. something that you can't reveal about people mm-hmm. because that's uh, that's that's not the right thing to do mm-hmm. but as an organization being transparent in the way that uh, the way you work and and what you do and say should be able to uh, to be defendable in the public eye mm-hmm. and in the public sphere i think is a good test of integrity so those are are some of the main values and at the bottom of it all for me is uh, is the word service that means that um, you know i i love the the word public service mm-hmm. a public servant as i have spent most of my time in life as a public servant okay. i know it's it's not 
not necessarily a, a title of honor in every culture, <laughs> but to me it is because Wonderful. it signals that leadership is service. Wonderful. My next question to you is I, something which I know you're, you know, very close to your heart, which is, you know, there is a lot of talk about the environmental, social, and governance values for most organizations. I know the Scandinavian countries have been at the forefront. What are your thoughts on how should organizations really start talking about this ESG values? Any organization uh, is uh, a part of a wider social context. Mm -hmm. uh, no organization is an island or, or an isolated atom in, in its world. Mm -hmm. So uh, any, any leadership has, is not strategic if it doesn't take into account how are we positioning ourselves uh, in, in, the, in the context we, uh, we work in, not only market-wise, but also socially? How are we, what, what is our contribution to, uh, to a better world? Mm -hmm. And most companies and organizations will have a good answer to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, there lies the, the very start of, of thinking as uh, social responsibly. It's mm -hmm. not something that is uh, a sugar coating of your, your uh, company and your profile or your brand. It, mm -hmm. it must come from the heart. It must come from the core of your business. But right. at that core, there is some element of social responsibility that you can develop mm -hmm. and develop from maybe strengthen your, your brand. And, and what uh, I see so wonderful the last few years have been to see companies taking and, and embracing the UN sustainable goals as their own hmm. and, and uh, relating uh, their activity to one or more of the, these 17 goals. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic because the whole world has got the common language in a way uh, for, for common good. Hmm. And in at this uh, very challenging time for the world, where we really experience that we are in the same boat, mm -hmm. on the same ocean, okay. dependent upon each other in every corner of the world, Correct. I think uh, uh, what really gives me hope is that companies, organizations, religious leaders, political leaders embrace these goals and find in them something where they can contribute. Terrific. So uh, I'm going to move to another subject. Uh, I mean, I wish I had lots of time to keep talking to you and you've got so much to talk about. But I'm going to talk now about the topic I heard you speak about in 2011, which was on gender diversity. You know, you've been an advocate of this. And I remember you used to speak about, uh, you know, a certain percentage of the Gavi board must be for women. What is your view on how can this imbalance be corrected faster? What we did in Gavi was that we, we, we passed a wonderful uh, gender policy, a diversity policy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I remember very, very well the board meeting when we did so. I was uh, still an ordinary board member. We looked around the table and said, well, this is a very nice piece of paper, but look around the board. This, you know, we're, I think we're 20% uh, women yes. uh, in the board at that time. And, uh, and when I became the chair and got the chance to do something about it, I just simply said, we are going to act on this uh, policy. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means uh, no nomination to, as, as new board members will pass me of, of men until we have reached what was our target, uh, one third of, of any gender. Mm -hmm. And so we practiced that and, and some people were angry uh, some people put down uh, diplomatic protests. Mm -hmm. Some people uh, loved it, mm -hmm. uh, and we did it. Correct. So I, I think uh, with with this, as with uh, with uh, smoking uh, legislation and other things that people say is not possible. Mm -hmm. Well, I I say with one of the the, the brands that is well known around the world, just do it. You you just have to do it. Correct. And and. Um, uh, sometimes you need a policy, mm -hmm. sometimes you need legislation. Mm -hmm. In Norway, I was a part of the cabinet uh, when we had for two years said to the large uh, corporations, uh, those uh, registered with the stock exchange, mm -hmm. that uh, you need to have at least 40% women. Mm -hmm. 
women on the boards. Mm. And uh, we give you two years okay. to fix it. Mm. And so, uh, I don't know if they believed it or not, but after two years, they hadn't fixed it. Mm. So we legislated it. And, uh, and now, uh, I don't think any uh, major corporation regrets that they were forced. Absolutely. Of course, there were a lot of debate, uh, but um, there is an added value. And, and uh, if you continue with these uh, arguments that, uh, well, we don't find uh, women that are competent. Oh, yes, they are competent, but they are not willing uh, and all that. You will go on and on and on for Correct. generations. Correct. And all those girls growing up will never have a chance because there, there are men, with all due respect, Ashutosh, in our age, yeah, hitting yeah. their blocking Absolutely. and saying it's not realistic. Correct. Correct. I agree with you. And, you know, I've given your example. I was on the, on the board of a couple of large public sector companies. And they were saying, how do we find women? And I said, well, I can give you one example. And I gave them your name. And as he just mandated it. And it got done. So, you know, I think what you say works. So I'm going to move to a few questions for you personally. I think I've got time for two or three more questions. Dr. Quinn, such an amazing career, such an amazing family. I mean, you know, you've done virtually everything. My question to you is, what does success mean to Dr. Quinn? Making the best of uh, the gifts and the opportunities that you are given. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like um, be, being a treasurer. It's like managing something that you have been entrusted with. Mm -hmm. and, and doing so for a greater good. Mm -hmm. Today, so many people are pleased if they can leave an impression. We, we talk, communication experts talk about the, the, the impression you leave. Mm -hmm. But uh, what kind of legacy is that? I think if you can leave some results, that's, mu that's mu much more important, much more tangible. Mm. I don't care about the impressions. Mm. Of course, it's nice with good impressions, but they, they, uh, doesn't, uh, they, do, they don't uh, live long. Mm. Uh, they, most of the time, they live a shorter life than I, I, I sell myself do. Uh, but if, if we can leave some uh, tangible results, it's really changing the lives of people, the conditions, living conditions of people, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and the way we, we run our societies. Mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, that's success. That's fantastic. So I'm now down to my last question to you. When I come back to the pandemic, you know, it's affected all our lives. Uh, you're closely associated with Gavi as well. But this question is to Dagfin as an individual to say, how are you rethinking your life? In the new world order. Well, that's a big question. I I, I feel that um, what we have been deprived of during the pandemic, in uh, opportunities to meet and to have fellowship mm -hmm. and to travel to each other and to to really engage. That that is, I think, something that that most people miss very very much mm -hmm. and it it shows the importance of relationships mm -hmm. so i think uh, the pandemic has really strengthened my focus on personal relationships as the building block in any any social life we are created social beings we're not created for the social distancing mm -hmm. uh, and when it's all over when we do have a vaccine which is effective and, uh, and uh, accepted by uh, nearly everyone around the world, then the new order for me is uh, an order where uh, the human being and the human relationships are put in at the center, uh, not only in my organization, but in my life. Wonderful. Well said. Dakwin, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you. I wish you lots of success, lots of good health, and whatever you're doing, I'm sure you will continue to be really successful. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me, Ashutosh. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to the brand called You Video Cast and Podcast. A platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.